another episode of Uncovered with Jared Kimber and Barra Sundaresan. Uh, we are going to talk about the World Cup because it's on. You're there. Um, I'm in random places trying to cover it in my private life, but uh, you're in Hobart. I'm going to let you pick which game we do first of which one um, you thought was either most surprising or most interesting. Uh, oof, I mean, uh, we're spoiled for choices already at this stage, right? If compared to how things went last year, uh, at least three out of the four games have been uh, really good games. I wouldn't say they've been surprising results. Uh, it, it's shown us a lot of what to expect going forward in the World Cup. And even though it's very early on, it I think it could well be a bowlers tournament uh, is what uh, I have I've decided. Even though Sikandar Raza played that beautiful innings last night and there have been a couple of other knocks. Uh, so maybe we should just start with, uh, because we're talking about bowlers, we could start either with Namibia, Sri Lanka or uh, Scotland, West Indies. And I have to say, Jared, I'm just loving the the wall design behind you there. I'm very tempted to know where you are. So the wall design in this hotel has, um, it's got like hidden codes in it so that your kids, when they're in the hotel room, they can use the wall design to work out how to unlock a, uh, a safe and then they get a present in the safe. I mean, for all the people listening into the podcast, that may not help as much uh, as they want. <laughs> uh, well, you, you said they weren't surprising. The bookmakers would disagree with you. I think we certainly had three underdogs win so far and mm. UAE went within a ball or two as well, if we're being honest. Um, but uh, let's start with the movie at Sri Lanka then. So uh, we both have seen enough of Namibia now to kind of know what they do. They bowl tight lines. It was funny. I saw in the dirt Nanus just before the game and he, he was saying, you know, what do they do? And I said, well, if there's like uh, an, advantage to be get, got from the pitch or from the shape of the field or the wind Namibia will just like robots mm. hone in on that and it was funny because they bowled a couple of short balls early to Sri Lanka and then they were just like no we're not going to bowl any more short balls yeah. we're just going to keep the ball up from here on in and do you remember Kusil Mendes went out trying to pull a ball way too full not that he doesn't always do that yeah. but it was very clear again that Namibia were just like oh okay we get this well we're just going to bowl really straight and then maybe they'll all hold out uh, long on and long off and miss a couple of the uh, the straighter ones um uh, it it really they really are just a incredibly disciplined team i'm not sure i've ever seen a team this disciplined before at just following one dogmatic method the way that they do and all of them do it right we saw it uh last year as well in the uae how they how quickly their bowlers adapted to those conditions and uh, and, and literally, they just became one of those teams where you could find run scoring difficult against them. I think towards the end of the tournament, they sort of got found out in the in the May at the Super Twelves, I guess. Uh, but throughout, before that, uh, they were just a bowling attack you just couldn't get away. Uh, they defended targets as well a couple of times uh, uh, from memory last year, uh, and it was it was the same old Namibia, like you said. Uh, and some of those guys who we saw last year just seem to have got better. And we haven't even seen Trumpleman yet. You know, the man who really made a name for himself last year. I think he's injured and he, he should be back at some point during this tournament. Uh, but, but you're right. Uh, I mean, they just take that the, the term nagging to another level. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, they do things uh, you expect or you would want your team or if, you, if if they are the team that you're backing uh, to do right uh, because they're not let's face it I mean, they're not a team with a lot of firepower uh, mm. so what's better than uh, no, what do you do if you don't have that kind of firepower is to find those weaknesses in the opposition and, and play with it I think that's what Scotland did so wonderfully well as well of course a much more accomplished team than maybe I guess uh, in some ways uh, but it, it's the same. It's picking out those weaknesses in the opposition and completely exploiting it. Also, and I don't think this has been talked about enough. We talked about the fact that it was a massive upset. And I think that's fair. I, I, I mean, the, I, the, the odds for Sri Lanka were, you know, basically non-existent, right? They, they were so favorite uh, mm. to win that game. 
Uh, we have seen Namibia beat Scotland um, and play some good games. They beat Ireland in the last World Cup as well. So it's not that we didn't think they could play because we knew that they could, but this is a different level than what we, what we saw before. But at the 15 over mark, they were, what, 95 or 93 for six? David Visa had just gone out. Um, I didn't look at the odds at that stage, but considering the two teams, you would have had to say that like Crickfizz would have been that would have been a negative chance of winning, not even not even a zero percent or a one percent, right? Like it's it's it, what we are saying is right, but you don't really expect an associate to come back from that mm. far away in the game. So the, the only one I could think about was the Kevin O'Brien innings where the yeah. island players were all off in the change room complaining they'd lost the game and then uh so they went out the balcony went, wait a minute what's happening here and look it shows in the eventual result as well right jared i mean we've had these kind of upsets in world cups before uh but more often than not they've been narrow wins uh you know it'll be uh the 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 more fancy team just faltering towards the end just getting a couple of things wrong uh, but this was this was a thumping at, at every point during the Sri Lankan innings. You just got a feeling that, yeah, but this pair will get together and fix fix this innings. Uh, and similarly, in in you know in the Namibian innings towards the end, after uh, uh, Fr Frylink and and Smith started like smashing it around, you thought that they'll just pull it back. They'll just find a way of stopping this. And because that's what we're used to seeing. Uh, often enough with associate teams uh, against test playing nations at this level. Uh, but Namibia just kept finding ways of not letting Sri Lanka come back. And, and this is a Sri Lankan team which I was fancying. I really thought they'd uh, uh, do well in this World Cup. They'll just cruise out of this stage like they did last year and, and actually put on a very good show. Uh, maybe they could still do that. I'm not saying Sri Lanka knocked out. Uh, but for Namibia to keep keep at them the way they did and to win by the margin they did, uh, it, it's one of the biggest wins ever, if you ask me, uh, or biggest upsets ever in the history of any cricket World Cups. Yeah, I was lower on Sri Lanka than most people um, because when you looked at their overall records in Sasana last World Cup, they were still winning 50% of the games. I know they did well in the Asia Cup and they did well in the last World Cup. Um I thought their absolute best was probably just short of the semifinals, which is still, you know, comparing from where they were, right? That's still really good. But yeah. I wasn't quite as high on them as everyone else. I didn't see them failing to get through the group, though. Like, you know, if, I just, there's no way to look at this group. And if they're in the other group, it's a yeah. little bit more interesting because that other group's chaos, right? I mean, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But but this particular group, I was looking at it going, yeah, I think I think this is, there and thereabouts um so no it's absolutely no doubt that it was um it, it was very interesting i think though it does show some of their problems so for instance they probably don't have that kind of bang on knock the ball around mm. score in the middle like roger pax is great and he was trying to do that but that's not really what you want him to be able to do and they don't really have anyone else who you would risk and i'm not even talking about an anchor but just I'm not sure they have a number four that plays like a number four um, out there. And the other thing was that they really lost this game in the death bowling, right? Yeah. And they've already lost one bolt fast bowler. Um, it, it, they've got everyone else is under an injury cloud, and they had Karuna Ratna and um, Hasaranga bowling at the death. Now, Hasaranga, I think you can get away with. He, 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 I think he went for over 10 runs in his over at the death, but it was 1-6. Um, and it, it might have been very good batting by Bard to realize it was wrong or it might just be I'm just going to swing and hope I hit one here <laughs> right um but Karuna Ratna from from everything I've seen him as a player I don't really understand why he's in the IPL and why Sri Lanka keep picking him I certainly don't think he should be bowling at the death and you look at the other the the the, the bang on seamers the specialist seamers it's not really what they do right and so it's making me think a little bit more about their team now we could just be overanalyzing this and they could come out and blitz. Well, actually, it could rain on Thursday and they could be out of the tournament, but we could be overanalyzing it a little bit. But it did feel to me that it was just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I think, I think I wrote before the tournament that I was worried about their seamers, not on talent, because I think there was enough good seamers around, but because everyone was either injured, coming back from injury, or in uh, the, the, the most recent case, leaving because of injury. Um, 
so it did look to me like they were a little bit maybe weaker than I thought they were. Regardless, even if they'd won, even if they'd come back mm. um, and won that game, I still think you were looking at, there were times in that game where I was just like, they're not quite as good as we think they are. Uh, and I think uh, you're, you're right as well. I mean, especially in these conditions. I mean, I do have a soft corner for Chamika Karna Ratne. I even um, coined him, uh, I gave him a moniker during that Australia tour there. I started calling him Star Boy. Uh, don't ask me why. I just like, we bumped into each other in the lift one day during the one day years. And I said, uh, uh, I said something along the lines of, oh, you should do something special today for no reason, really. And uh, they ended up winning that game. And that night, uh, Jared, and this is just like in a classic R areas, right? As uh, Louis Cameron, Clancy, and I were getting into the lift, we had to wait for the Sri Lankan team to get into the lift first. Um, and he looked at me and, they, I mean, they were all excited. Sri Lanka had won the series, the one-day series, and like pumped his chest and like pointed at me. And I don't know why, I just screamed out, star boy. <laughs> it's stuck ever since. <laughs> so, uh, I do think he uh, he... I mean, he plays an underrated role for that team. But you're right. Uh, the times that they have won T20s in the last uh, 18 months or so, it's come down to Dasun Sanuka or uh, at times Karuna Ratna or one of these guys just pulling off a blinder in the last couple of overs. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of their batters go at that uh, the middle of the range strike rate from top to bottom. Uh, I, I, was a, I was really high on Charit Asalanka, uh, but who of course didn't play in this game. Uh, so, yeah, I think, look, there are problems, clearly. Uh, and uh, uh, another reason I did back Sri Lanka is, uh, you know, they're one of the few teams who have played some recent T20I cricket in Australia. Well, there was a five-game series earlier in the year. Uh, but, yeah, clearly, I mean, Namibia definitely looked the better team. Uh, and who knows, they look favourites now to get into the Super 12s uh, in back-to-back -back years. And some of those bowlers, like we said, uh, just seem to have gone better from last year. And they're, if, the, if they bowl the way they do, they might get some more help on these pitches for sure from uh, what we saw in the UAE. Uh, and they're going to be a much more of a handful this time, I think, than last year. Yeah, no doubt. The three things I want to mention just quickly is that um, uh, Sri Lanka, weirdly enough, have played in Geelong before when almost no one else ever has. <laughs> you would have thought True. that was an advantage. I don't think we've given enough credit to the fact that Namibia are probably more used to uh, than, you know, faster pitches just because they're from Namibia and you know, we, we, you know, there's this idea of Western teams and Asian teams. It's like, well, that's not really how these things work, mm. right? In this particular case, you know, they've got a huge advantage over the Netherlands or Scotland who play most of their cricket on different kinds of pitches. Yeah. The only other thing I would say is not, not that it was a fluke because they were, but they were a long way behind in the game. Namibia, the only way they're going to win games consistently is if their top order starts scoring at more than a run of ball and, 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 I didn't see anything in that particular game. But we'll have a break here. And then after the break, we'll go to Scotland defeating your West Indies. You're listening to Cricket's Conversation on 99.94. Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube, or on the 99.94 app. We have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. So Scotland defeated your West Indies, Barrett. Um, again, I mean, I was on the Edges and Surges podcast. I think you've been on them as well. They're on 99.94 now, so everyone should listen to them. Not yeah. bef like before, no one should listen to them, but now everyone should. But um, yeah. I was on there and they, they they were sort of like, so West Indies will qualify. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I kind of feel like any of those four teams could qualify. And if you, I think I said that, like, there was, there was like, well, I said that if Zimbabwe qualified, I wouldn't have been surprised. And I kind of feel in some ways that if, the best version of Scotland turned up. They should almost be the best team in, in that group. Now, they haven't been the best team for a while. You know, that a lot of their batting had fallen off. Um, even having said that, though, that was a very disappointing game for West Indies. They bowled poorly at the start. They bowled poorly at the end. Um, and then they didn't bat. And and the fielding was not great at all. Uh, I mean, it, they just looked like a disjointed unit, to be honest, Jared. Uh, from From the beginning... Uh, 
you know, you you know, you're looking at a team who, uh, I don't know, are just either not fitting together as a unit or or something's not right. When there are a lot of arms being thrown up for uh, pretty much every misfield, uh, every half chance, uh, they just look at some levels very unhappy uh, to be out there. I mean, it was very very cold and miserable to start with. Uh, it there it was, is hard. This, it is Hobart. It is Hobart. And uh, there was no forecast for rain yesterday. But as you know, in Hobart, uh, it can come from the hills or it can come from Antarctica, wherever it comes from. It, it, it's always, it, it almost drops, the temperature drops by, uh, it feels like at least it drops by seven, eight degrees. So it, it was pretty miserable when the game started. Uh, and you could see the West Indians in the warm-up as well. Like, you know, they were all huddled up. They, they, didn't, they didn't look very comfortable being out there to start with. Uh, and, and look, it's not a quick, a old, old wives' tale of oh, West Indies never play in cold conditions. A lot of them play county cricket. They a lot of play, them play in T20 leagues in cold condition. But just yesterday, it just didn't seem right from the beginning. Uh, and, and they got the reprieve as well. The rain came at the right time. Uh, I mean, Munzi and Jones started off uh, in mm. great fashion. Uh, they hit the ball around really well. And you thought maybe, you know, Scotland would get a big score, like a 170, 180, even, you know, close to 200. The rain came at the right time for the West Indies. Uh, and j- even just before the rain came, uh, there was this review with Obed McCoy uh, to Manzi where he, he was he really kept urging yeah. Puran to take the review. And finally, Puran almost, uh, uh, as if to just keep his bowler happy, took the review. Luckily, they retained that review. Uh, and just seeing them walk off the field when it rained, I don't know. I, it, it's like I said, they just didn't look too happy. And then they came back, and uh, like Phil Simmons says, said at the end of the day, uh, they have a very good record between overs number seven and fifteen in the last uh, year or so. And the bowlers did the right job; they kept them uh, at bay. George Muncy just didn't get going. Uh, there were a couple of really crucial innings from. Uh, I think Greaves came and played uh, a few shots. Callum McLeod looked like a dream. Mm-hmm. He came and batted for uh, just around 20 minutes. But I think that gave them some momentum. Uh, but again, towards the end, some of the decisions on the field, the bowling changes. Uh, Jason Holder had, what, figures of two for five at one point. He bowled one more over and he didn't bowl out. And Obed McCoy, uh, you know, he's been built up as their main death bowler for at least uh, 18 months, 24 months now. And Odeon Smith has done that job. He did that against Australia. But they went back to him for the 20th over, which went for quite a few runs. Manzi, uh, uh, I mean, some some people in the press box felt he was playing a match losing innings at that point because his strike rate was closer to 100 than to 125. But I think he got those boundaries away. Uh, and I... I at the halfway mark, 160 looked like a very good total, Gerald. I, I, you said I was worried for my West Indies, uh, to be honest. There were a couple of long boundaries. Uh, but the way they started, I thought, uh, uh, you know, maybe they'll they'll get away with it. Uh, Kyle Myers, uh, because the ball started coming on as well. It started, the pitch looked a little tacky to start with. A lot of horizontal bat shots. Uh, getting caught at mid-wicket or, uh, you know, on the fence, but uh, but not really on the fence, but a few yards in, uh, which also may be why Akil Hussain a couple of times really messed up on the boundary, just in terms of positioning, uh, much to the, the dismay of his bowlers and his team. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Akil Hussain did not have a great day on the field and then later on got run out as well. Uh, in similar fashion, he just looked very doozy. Uh, but... Unbelievable uh, uh, turnaround from the Scotland spinners. I've always been a big fan of Mark Watt. Uh, he and I told you this last night as well. There's just something so uh, raw and relatable about him. Uh, you know, it's uh, I, and I put this line in my piece as well. Like he talks about uh, deceit, like or when he talks about deceiving batters. Uh, there's no sense of deceit about it. Like, you know, it's, mm. it seems like a very, look, I, I don't know what I'm doing half the time, the, the 24 yarders, uh, uh, because I asked him in the mix zone yesterday. He said, I really don't know when I decide to bowl. Half the time, I don't even realize I have. I just see something. I don't know what it is. The batter's not ready or his head, eyes are looking down. And I just slip it in. And he got, he bowled four of those yesterday and three of those resulted in the three wickets that he got. Uh, I think, but credit to Michael Leask. I think that's where the turnaround really happened. Uh, before, uh, what started off well in that first over, uh, he was bowling in swingers, and Michael Leask said, I think he swings the ball, 
apart from Safian Sharif, I think he's our best swing bowler. And he was swinging the ball. And he said he was working uh, on this in-swinger to left-handers. Uh, he's just some... I don't know. I find him to be a very interesting cricketer. There's just something about him that uh, you, you like to watch. Uh, you know, he's always trying something new. Uh, he's not afraid at all of, uh, you know, at times looking a little foolish on the field. Uh, mm. And I think nothing sums up Mark Watt better than the fact that uh, on a day he produces uh, arguably his best T20 performance or, or the most notable anyway, he ended up speaking about a piece of paper that he was carrying in his hand. So it, it was, uh, you know, that it, it was a really good performance, I thought, uh, from Scotland, but some shocking batting from the West Indies. Like it was a classic, if, uh, you know, if I don't do it, somebody else will kind of batting and some decisions mm. in the end, like, I couldn't believe that Alzari Joseph batted 9 and Odian Smith batted 10. A, I'm surprised Odian Smith didn't bat 8. But at least you had the uh, the, the argument of uh, you wanted a left-right combination out there. I thought they were just, just... I thought it was just that they were trying to keep Odian back as far as possible so that when he came in, he could just explode. But yeah, it didn't make any sense. Phil Simmons talked about a lack of professionalism, didn't he? What, what do yeah. you think he meant? I haven't, I haven't, I just saw the headline, so I don't really know. But what was he, what was he saying, really? Do you think that? Oh, no. I mean, uh, A, we went for the press conference. There weren't too many of us here. And like, uh, you know, the Philip Spooner, the great media manager, uh, he just, I think, uh, he just looked at me and said, Bharat, start us off. So I was like, I, you know, I'm not one, I, I'm not an opener when it comes to press conferences. Uh, but, uh, you know, you could just see on Phil Simmons' face, he was really seething, uh, but he kept himself under control. So I just asked him to sum it up and he used the word unprofessional I think three or four times in that first answer about their batting group that is never a good sign when a coach does that uh, and he said he kept saying there are no excuses and then I said like why why does it keep happening and he said uh and, and you know you know Phil Simmons if you've seen him in press conferences which is generally over the years uh when he starts giggling you know he's really trying to control himself like uh, he's really trying to make sure he doesn't explode uh, and say something really nasty you know, in a press conference and he just said that look we haven't got time to discuss uh, what's happened in the dressing room we're waiting for the i'm waiting for the boys to calm down more importantly i'm waiting for myself to calm down <laughs> and uh, yeah he was not giving any excuses for his batters uh, uh, it was a shocking display and he literally called it that um yes well it was yeah, they were bad in almost 80% of that game. They actually did well to only lose it by as much as they did. Um, just on Mark Watt, I think I think a lot of the things you said are really true about him. What, what I've always found really interesting about him is how natural he was with everything. So he doesn't look like a natural athlete, right? But, no. but he thinks about cricket in a really, really high-level way, despite the fact that if you talk to him, and maybe doesn't always come across, but you could see with all the different moves that he makes on the, on the field. So he, and this was quite a, a few years back, he was bowling left arm wrist into left handers because he was having trouble with left handers. And, um, uh, and to be honest, I think he just worked out a better way to deal with it, which most left arm finger spinners can't bowl to left handers. Right. So, yeah. you know, it, it show it shows the sort of person, um, that he is and, he, I don't think he studied people like Ashley Giles or Michael Beer or Michael Yardy or even um, Imad Wazim, those sorts of people. And so he's created this other version and he does bowl like a heavy seam up delivery um, kind of style, except that he is a spinner. Um, I think the only thing I haven't seen him try yet is the knuckleball. And I think eventually he'll probably bowl a knuckleball as well. And he, I'm, I'm sure he's tried it in the net. I haven't, I haven't talked to him over the last couple of years, but I think I suggested that he should look into it um, at the time. But I, I did find it interesting that he was looking at the notes because it's not really the uh, Mark Watt that I knew. The Mark Watt I know is very easygoing. In fact, the only story I've ever heard of him being quite upset was when he was very young. Um, and I think when Derby first let go of him, and he was really, really upset. He couldn't understand why Derby had let go of him. But, um, uh, but, but outside of that, he, he, he's, um, he's just a very, very smart cricketer. And he does, uh, the cricketer he reminds me of the most is Michael Beer, right? Of mm. just, and, and the only difference I would say is that Michael Beer wore his intelligence uh, more comfortably. Like Michael Beer would really talk up a good game. Whereas when you talk to Waddy, it's, you do have to kind of dig out the nuggets, but 
if you do chat to him for long enough, you realize he is seeing the game on another level because you can't yeah. bowl left arm finger spin and not spin the ball and not be incredibly smart. Like, you know, m- most left arm finger spinners uh, are, are rubbish in, in T20 cricket because I can't bowl to left handers to begin with, Brian. So I, I think the whole thing is really interesting um, uh, to me. Um, uh, and Leesky, just to go on to Leesky, what I find interesting about him as a spinner is just that he is a part-timer and it can go horribly wrong. Mm. Um, but there are very, you don't get many part-timers who rag it, right? Part-timers usually just roll their fingers over it. Yeah. If you, like when he gets the ball to spin, really, really turns. Um, and he's been a long-term project player. But look, I think it's interesting that we started with West, with West Indies, which I did by accident, really. Um, that shows you how much Scotland has changed. Uh, we're now yeah. not seeing it as, it's not, in our eyes, it's not like the Namibia beating Sri Lanka game. Right now, maybe this is also West Indies, but I also think that at this point, we've just seen Scotland win um, and be competitive against so many sides. And I don't know if they're still the the great Scotland uh, of that sort of period where they were killing all the associates a few years ago. Obviously, Kyle Kutzer has gone. Um, uh, I think Richie Barrington's probably out of their four top batters. Richie Barrington mm. was really the only one with any form coming in. I mean, Munsey's innings was incredible because he would have hated that innings. I actually think and he will probably listen to this and be angry at it, but I actually think he would prefer to make 20 off 10 than he would to, <laughs> to make 60 off 55, whatever it was. Um, it, you know, it's just not the way he thinks. But the Callum McLeod innings, I thought, was exceptional, as you, you pointed yeah. out as well. So it, really interesting to see where they go um, going forward in this tournament. But let's take a break. And then after that, we'll talk about Zimbabwe Island and UAE Netherlands. If you love the language of cricket, and want more, then head over to the 99.94 app and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 99.94 DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you about Zimbabwe Island because you were there uh, for that one. Um, I saw the first innings. Uh, I didn't see as much of the second innings. Um, but, I mean, rather. I mean, I, I can't remember if I was, I think a couple of years ago, I was working for his agent. I think this is right. And when I looked into his numbers, I was like, why is this guy not? in every yeah. franchise in the world. And I, the only thing I can really work out is that if he bowled left arm finger spin rather than off spin, I reckon <laughs> he probably would have got more games. But that was the only, everything else you looked at, I just, I couldn't work out where he would, where he would actually, um, you know, fit in from that perspective. Um, he, he just seemed like a good player. I would say he's better now than he was a couple of years ago, though. It seems to have all clicked for him. It, it it really comes across as that, right? We've seen these kind of things happen in, in sport all the time where uh, uh, there's never been any doubt about, uh, you know, how skilled he is. Uh, forget about the talent. Uh, he's got the skill. He's, he's generally always had the temperament as well. Uh, but they've not always clicked together. Uh, and I, just seeing him yesterday, uh, Jared, and just seeing the Zimbabwe side overall, uh, there just seems to be a, so much better vibe about them. Uh, we, we speak about the West Indies and, like I said, how they just didn't look like like a team yesterday. Uh, the Zimbabwe Mindless. team, yeah, even when you see them in training or just see them running onto the field, I mean, that was interesting as well. I've never seen four international cricket teams on the ground at the same time <laughs> because the game went on for so long uh, because of the mm-hmm. rain uh, that as West Indies and, uh, you know, Scott, the Scots were... Uh, this shaking hands, Zimbabwe and Ireland ran onto the field. It felt like a lot like club cricket or, you know, school cricket almost uh, that that moment. But they just seem like they're in a happy space. And Sikandar Raza spoke about it as well. He said, maybe it's credit to uh, Dave Houghton and what he's done. He's given us senior players the freedom, but with that freedom comes accountability. Uh, and uh, how he's enjoying almost the pressure of uh, being the real informed batter where he's scoring just a high percentage of the runs that his team's scoring both in T20 cricket and 50 over cricket. Uh, uh, but you're right. Uh, he's uh, he's not someone um, uh, who uses his feet much, but he's got such incredible hands. Uh, mm. You see it when he, when he drives the ball, but uh, when he picks up those uh, uh, 
uh, shots, you know, or, or the onside. Uh, he's just got incredible hand-eye, uh, great reflexes, uh, and he can hit all around the ground. We saw it uh, even uh, briefly during that one-day series against Australia. Obviously, he loves the ball coming onto the bat, but we've seen him, him in other conditions play spin really well uh, on the slightly lower, slower wickets, uh, you know, uh, in other parts of the world, even at times in Zimbabwe. Uh, his game has come off this year. But and, uh, but again, just seeing him in the field as well, uh, he, he was next to a... a where the Zimbabwean fans were, he he was constantly chatting with them. He, he, back in the day, like when Sekandar Raza uh, was around the Zimbabwean side, he just always looked uh, a little stressed, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, you know, he he's always had this cool vibe about him, but he used to look a little stressed. But he just seems really relaxed. Uh, and I mean, he spoke about wanting to stay balanced and all that uh, in with the highs and lows. But yeah, he's just in this really wonderful space. Uh, and I think more than anything, he's enjoying being the the center of attention for the for the team. His bowling as well. He spoke about how he's uh, really uh, been picking Sunil Narayan's ear. He bumped into him in the BPL and uh, in another league. Uh, and after shoulder surgery, he just can't uh, do a lot with it. Uh, so he's just developed this uh, very Sunil Narayan esque uh, style of bowling, and and it's coming off as well. So so. He's just in in a great space. Uh, he would have liked this to have come a few years ago, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, he's in that space, and more importantly, he's making the most of it. And overall, I think it is really helping the Zimbabwean side because it's a good mix of some senior players, uh, but a lot of young cricketers as well. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure we'll speak about that bowling attack. Uh, I would love to see the Zimbabwean bowling attack we saw yesterday in a Test match. You know, there's something about them. The, the, they're tall. They hit that proper Australian lens. And in, a test wickets... match, in a test match, not in Zimbabwe. Because if they bowled in oh, Zimbabwe, yeah, yeah, yeah. they it, would be ex- absolutely ruined. No, no I mean, I think so. I said before the tournament in my preview, I basically picked Raza and their seamers as the strength, right? I, I, Ryan Burl, you could throw in there as well. Because hmm. because of him and Raza, you've got two guys batting in the top six or seven who can uh, both bat and bowl. So that's quite quite handy but the seam bowlers are really good obviously you know blessing they lost him for a long time uh he was a coal pack he almost signed i've heard that he did sign with major league and it fell through but i don't know how true all that sort of stuff is um but yeah i think you're right i think those seamers i mean yesterday raza is the difference between the two teams but i think those seamers de- definitely deserve a lot of credit um island i said coming in that if balboni's lack of form continued um mm. and harry tector didn't go ballistic it felt like the last world cup it's either like paul sterling or nothing when he went out yesterday that's kind of how i felt again mm. yeah I, when you look at the, the, the four teams here they're the ones for is based purely on these conditions uh they're the ones who just seem to lack that x factor i don't know what it is like even before that game began um, Zimbabwe just looked so so much better on paper as well uh, with the with their bowling attack in particular. And I thought the Irish did really well with the ball. Uh, maybe uh, you know the Raza was the difference, like you said. I mean, you take Raza's innings out, and like I know Ireland are comfortable. And, and Andy Balbany spoke said that as well. Like they were very happy with. Uh, I mean, not very happy, but they were happy at the halfway mark. They they felt mm. they could chase down that 170. It was just really good bowling. Uh, you know, once you're reduced to. Uh, uh, Four for 22. Look how Australian I have become, Jared. Even though it's a World Cup, it was four for 22, not 22 for that's what four. That's it said on the scoreboard. I, know, right? I know, that's true. On the scoreboard, it says 22 for four, which seems like it's putting me off uh, <laughs> to see 22 for four in Australia. But, uh, you know, after that, and two of those wickets, especially uh, Musarabani, the two wickets he took, caught it slip, like classic test match wickets, including Balboni. Uh, I think from there, Ireland just did not have enough to get up to the total, but I still think they did a good job with their run rate. Uh, eventually got those crucial runs in the end. Uh, McCarthy hit some uh, powerful blows. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, at the moment, they still look better than the West Indies, to be honest, in this group. Uh, and, and if maybe, you know, they just not lost four wickets and lost just two or three, maybe they could have still made a match of it. Uh, but but Zimbabwe were just like, just look the best team in this group at the moment. Um, interestingly enough, Ireland are uh, favourites with the bookies in the game against Scotland, which, having seen them both play today, I'm not sure uh, I would have um, necessarily felt. But it's a, it's a couple of days out from the game, so maybe things yeah. will change a little bit there. Um, uh, UAE and Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands 
bowled very well and should have cruised to victory and fell apart. I'm not sure there's that much to to say about them because the strength is their middle order at chasing low totals. And basically, Junaid Siddiqui got the ball to reverse swing and yeah. uh, they lost two guns in a row. I can't remember how Ackerman went out, but he wasn't not much before that. Um, and that's probably what you would expect the Netherlands to go on with. That You wouldn't really, unless Roloff's finished, and I don't think he's finished, um, mm. and or Roloff and Cooper, because they're both quite old if we're being, yeah. <laughs> at this point. Um, but unless they're both finished and they're both hit the hit the uh hit the thing i don't think there's much to say about netherlands um but i did think they bowled really well early on to uae um uae still are going to struggle to make enough runs to put any pressure on anyone but it was lovely watching them actually manage to still uh, put pressure on on the netherlands well, it, it really was uh you know you looked at that group and uh, UAE almost stand out as uh, the team that you aren't expecting much from in in these Australian conditions, and and that Dutch team, uh, and I'm sure you've spoken a lot about this, are so used to playing in Australia. I mean, some of those names. I mean, I I, I often end up doing shield commentary with Tom Cooper, uh, you know. So uh, he's as South Australian as it comes. But uh, you know, for a while he wasn't with the Netherlands team. He's come back now, and, and like you know. A lot of the others as well, they're so used to playing in Australia. A lot mm. of them live in Australia. Uh, we saw uh, towards the end, uh, you know, uh, some of their parents uh, looking very excited for a Dutch win, which always uh, I find funny. Like, you know, oh, he just walked down from the end of the street and here he is supporting Netherlands. But yeah, uh, it was, uh, they, they, sh- they were favorites going into that game. Uh, but, but UAE are, I mean, they're just, you just see them as a bunch of street smart cricketers, right? I mean, mm. a, a lot of these expats I find, uh, you know, fascinating. They, they they move countries and they just love the sport so much. I think they end up playing uh, cricket or more games of cricket than than even some of the some of the players in the regular countries. Like, you know, they would have stayed back. Uh, and you can see that street Let's smartness. Let's be honest. Come- yeah. If, you're, if you move to the UAE and you play a lot of cricket, you have to love it because it is un. Play. I have had so many friends of mine that are Australian and English and New Zealanders. A lot of them that go over to work with the ICC, they're proper cricket people. And there's just like, yeah. there's no proper leagues. It's too hot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like in the, quite often like you try and play a game and they're, they're like someone will call you up at like 1 p.m. and go, there's a game in Sharjah in an hour. Can you get there? And they're like, well, I'm in Dubai. Like, I don't yeah. have my kit with me and all this sort of stuff. So... I do think that the people who end up playing cricket in the UAE are absolutely committed to it in a way. I mean, I don't know if you've ever hung around at the ICC um, Academy with, with all the net bowlers. Those yeah. guys, they just turn up and they just, like, when the qualifiers were there, they would just bowl from morning to night. And yeah. um, we, I think it was me, um, the um, the physio from Scotland and the Bermuda um, coach were all just like, you need to get these guys for food uh-huh. and drink. They're going to die. It's ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, there is a spirit with UAE cricket. Um, I'm just happy that they've finally ditched the ugly grey shirts after all those years. Um, oh. Let's finish up. You had one funny thing from the Zimbabwean game, which um, which I didn't see. So uh, what have you got there? No, I mean, it, it was more cute than funny. So uh, if, if you watched the Zimbabwe game, you would have seen uh, the bunch of Zimbabwean fans who just rocked up uh, mm. a, a, and created a lot of noise. And firstly, I was just taken aback that of, of the four teams who played yesterday, uh, Zimbabwe had the biggest fan contingent uh, in Hobart. Uh, so I was very curious and I just had to go find out what was happening. Uh, so I walked. Uh, 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 over like alongside my Craig bus uh, colleague Ganesh uh, and we just like towards towards the end and this is when Sikandar Raza was feeling right in front of uh, them and as soon as we got there we heard Sikandar Raza say something like uh, but but you know you need to get the cricket chance right I mean these are not these are not cricket chance come on you need to do better uh, and they I mean they just like giggled and laughed at uh, whatever he said and continued doing what they were doing uh, and then, like, right next to us, there were these, you know, two, three, uh, there would have been, what, around 50 of them. Uh, but there are all sorts of selfies being taken with each other, uh, not so much with the players. Uh, they're all posing for pictures with the flag. And I um, I had to I had to start speaking to one of them. So there was this lovely guy called Leslie. Uh, and uh, he initially said, yeah, 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 we've come all from all around Australia to support uh, our team, our country, and all around Australia, there were people from Perth, Townsville, uh, Melbourne, I, I mean, you name it. And I was like, 
these must be real hardcore cricket fans if they've come all the way. But they weren't. <laughs> like at least 80% of them um, did not know much about cricket at all. To the extent, like, so Leslie is uh, busy talking to us and he was so happy he'd bumped into someone, a couple of people he went to school with in Harare 25 years ago. And he bumps into them at this at this cricket ground. Uh, and so I was like, wow, they're going to, now with Zimbabwe likely to qualify from this group, they'll follow them all around the park. And so I asked, I started asking a couple of questions about what their movements would be. And I think that's where Leslie realized that, oh, oh, I mean, I don't think he was qualified to answer these questions. And this is when, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ireland were five down and, and not really looking good. Suddenly he pulls me aside, Jared, and says, uh, actually, you know what? Can you tell me if you're doing well or not in this game? I have no idea what's happening out there. <laughs> and, and then he realized pretty much all of them are in the same boat. Uh, and then I said, yeah, yeah, your team's doing really well. You're about to win. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to take five more of those things, right? Five more of those things. He said, five more wickets. Five more wickets. Yes, yes, yes. And he immediately went and told his friends that they were doing really well. So I just found it really fascinating that these people have come from all around the country to support their team, which is really cute. But without knowing what the hell is happening out there? Uh, you know, I, I've never come across uh, something like that on, on, a, on a cricket pitch or an, at a cricket ground. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they went back home uh, happy with what had happened. And no wonder the Raza was surprised that they didn't know any of the cricketing chants. That's insane. But I suppose how many times, in, if you're a Zimbabwean, do you get to support Zimbabweans in Australia? So, I, I, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, for those who don't know, traveling from Townsville to Hobart, um, and Perth to Hobart is no yeah. joke. Um, it you is know, not. You, you, you're talking legitimate uh, multiple flights, probably a minimum two flights from Townsville, maybe three sometimes. Um, and uh, Perth is uh, it's a long way away from Hobart as well. Uh, thank you very much. I will talk to you next week. Um, and um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to tell you. No, there's nothing I need to tell you. Um, uh, I'll talk to you next week and we'll see where uh, where we are then. Thanks, sir. Thanks for coming on again. And uh, um, have you got anything coming out? You got, you're going to write a Mark Watt piece. Is that what everyone should be looking out for? Yeah, I mean, it's a Mark Watt Scotland uh, piece. Yeah, if that makes sense. But I have a couple of cool stories from uh, Tasmania, which I think we'll talk about for sure next week. Perfect. All right. I'll see you next time, mate. See ya. See ya.